So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I was born uh, in uh, New York, Brooklyn to be specific. I went to school at uh, Syracuse University. I went on to law school at St. John's. I practiced for a few years. I went into the nightclub business. Uh, and uh, from there, I went into the hotel business. Great. So do you think that the early entry into um, the nightclub business kind of gave you the dynamic of working with people and kind of learning a lot about maybe art and um, kind of the development industry and how that kind of prefaces itself for your long-term career into hoteling? Is, did, that, did that lay the framework and kind of foundation uh, as, as to getting into the hotel I think industry? the best thing about going into the nightclub business is that it doesn't have any discernible product, uh, nothing distinguished from all the other nightclubs. Um, it has the same music, has the same alcohol, and the way you market uh, and distinguish yourself is by trying to create magic, right. uh, trying to, you know, mask all the details so a certain alchemy happens. And so when I went into the hotel business, I had a product, I had a bed, but I didn't rely on that bed. I still relied on trying to create that magic and create that alchemy. So I think the approach I learned in the nightclub business kind of suited me well and, and helped me and prepared me to go into the hotel business and give me a leg up on trying to distinguish myself. Perfect. And now building off of that magic, it seems like you're always trying to follow kind of how the market's reacting and, and looking at kind of where people are in the present day and kind of projecting into the future. And you talked about it a little bit during the panel, but you try to create this value and this kind of fresh idea for people. So how has that fresh idea kind of evolved over your kind of tenure into the, the hotel industry and development into the to hotels? Well, I, I consider myself more a uh, social scientist than a, than a hotel guy. You know, I, you know, there are signposts out there. It's, 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 it's up to uh, you to kind of see it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, skirt lengths go up and down, and they go up and down collectively in Europe, in America, for some uh, unexplainable reason. I'm, I'm always looking at popular culture and, 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 and what's going on uh, with, with people in general because the idea is to try and hit that zeitgeist. The idea is to try and anticipate where people are headed, even if they don't know they're headed that way, but you can kind of feel it instinctively. I don't think you can get it through analysis. I think you have to kind of have a certain kind of feel for it, an insight. A, a, a vision for it, and I think every time we do something, every time I would do something, it then responds to where I think the collective consciousness of the people are, or where I think they will be headed. And sometimes you want to lead them to where uh, you think they're, 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 they might get there on their own, but it, it might take longer for them to get there. Right, and do you think a reason for being that successful in the New York place is because you have been here, you've been surrounded by the real estate for such a long period of time. So is it kind of that coupled with you know your knowledge and kind of expertise of working through the hotel industry of what kind of created your value throughout the, the era, era of Ian Schrager, I guess? It's a social thing. It's really, you know, what is it that people want? Uh, what is it that people will buy? Uh, and, uh, you know, I have an outlet to the hotel industry, but it actually could work in any industry, you know, any it's universal field. model, right? Absolutely. So it doesn't start with what do people want in a hotel. It starts with something more fundamental. What do people want? Right. Uh, and 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 I try and respond to that, and then I try and put it into a an effective business model. Right. Do you feel like there's a half life on any of your kind of investments or developments and whatnot, and that they kind of phase out over a period of time? And how do you kind of counteract that with like capital expenditures and kind of revamping kind of the structure as things kind of go on along? Well, if there were a half-life, I'd kill myself. <laughs> you know, the whole idea is, 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 is that I always feel that, you know, you can do something provocative uh, uh, and, and it stands the test of time, provided that it's executed well. So I would never want to do anything that had a half-life. I mean, I've never changed the hotel room I did uh, since the first one I did back in 1982. Because if, if, if it's good then, it's kind of timeless and it lasts, you know, forever. Uh, you know, that part of, you know, what interests me about the whole whole world. Most of the hotel uh, uh, industry changes their rooms every five years. We don't. We keep the rooms the same. We keep them fresh. We, 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 we keep them stylish. But we, we never change the basic fundamental idea. If it was a fundamental idea that was you know, you know, compelling in, 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 in one year, it should be compelling forever. Right, and it seems like that, that's a consistent theme on the kind of invest, investments that you've directly made into the, the real estate sector in, in New York specifically. So now kind of going forward, can you talk a little bit maybe about um, the public hotels that you're kind of rolling out now? 
what kind of trends are you trying to develop into these projects and, and what do you see as kind of the new era in hoteling going forward? Well, it starts out with the notion that, um, you know, I don't think that, um, I think this country, uh, uh, although it's going to do well, and I'm not saying that this generation is not going to live as well as the next generation, no, nothing like that, but, I, but it's more mature. Uh, and uh, uh, the upward mobility is not as freewheeling as it used to be. I hear that from a lot of people that come over here from Europe. Uh, when, they, when they first got here, they used to be able to do anything and everything. Now there are a lot of things that are kind of obstacles that have to be overcome in order to accomplish something. Uh, so there's realizations like that, and, and, and there's also realizations that I, I'm feeling, and not by a focus group and not by data, instinctively, I'm feeling you know, that people are interested in value, right. you know, that, that uh, uh, rich people as well. Uh, uh, and, and so to me, I wanted to do a product that was responsive to that. You know, that, that, that you can stay in a luxury hotel and you can spend half or a third what you would spend in another luxury hotel and not give up anything. Right. That you could stay in the coolest place in town and, and, and get real value for it. Uh, and, and, I, and I think to me that's a, a winning combination. Plus the fact I think, um, you know, people are very interested in getting good service, but not obsequious service and not traditional notions of luxury service. Service that's important, that elevates the stay, and it's more than essential services, but it's services that you need and services that you want, and, and, and not providing the same kind of services that we've done for the last hundred years. Right. Uh, I mean, we, we constantly have to, you know, review what we're doing and, and, and update it because people change. Right. And, and so out of those kind of thoughts came public. Uh, which is um, a, a hotel of inclusion, you know, rather than exclusion. Uh, it, it, it's just as sophisticated visually as anything uh, anybody would expect from us. You know, the food and beverage and the entertainment concepts are, are like, you know, really energized and spectacular. But the rate... Right. It's a good value, right. and you're not going to be feeling uh, ripped off. So, and 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 like all our products, just like the same uh, people who buy Apple products, they don't fit into a neat demographic box. You know, it could be a 16 year old, it could be an 80 year old, right. uh, and so this is a product for people of all ages. You know, of all different strata of wealth, because it's just sophisticated. It applies and appeals to a kind of mindset, a sensibility. And, and it's a very exciting space, and I think, you know, we're going to have the same impact in this space that we had in the boutique space 25 years ago. Right. So now it's just kind of growing on that a little bit. You're creating this value, and I don't want to say you're giving rooms at a discount, but you're, you're making it more marketable to the entire demographic of kind of everyone that's looking for a hotel space. How are you expecting returns on investments like this? I mean, are, are there any, I don't want to say corners you're cutting, but how are you realizing the returns um, in the hotel industry by taking on this kind of value add or value proposition to your customer base? Well, we're, we're hopeful of getting returns 40 to 50 percent really? profit margins. Wow. Um, you know, the labor component is cut down not by depriving people of services, but by deciding on which services they really care and want. Right. Uh, and um, so we think that it, that it is a plus. Right. I mean, I think the most successful, probably the two most successful brands in the entire industry uh, are courtyard by Marriott and Hilton Garden Inn. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, so I think, you know, those brands, you know, are ripe for some disruption and somebody coming in and doing something really special and bringing a premium to that Because you're space. saying they target the value kind of customer. Right. Right. Um, no, that, that's, that's great. And I mean, I read a little bit on it, but it seems like, you know, you have the common sense customer service that you need, but everyone else is kind of out of the way. Like, you walk into one of the spaces and it's like, I feel like I'm at home, has the amenities you need, not the kind of overbearing kind of service where, you know, someone's opening the door for you, someone's grabbing your bag, someone's doing this. For... For the people that want value, they don't need all that. And like you said, they don't want to take a $5 bill out every time and 
thank you very much, thank you. By the time you get up to your room, you're 20, 30 dollars lighter, right? So exactly. I, I, I like it, I, I think it's going to flourish. It sounds like a great idea. Um, and I, I, is that something you're similarly doing with the addition kind of partnership with Marriott as well, or no. how is that different? Addition is different, but I just want to point out one thing. It's not only the services you need, Right. it's what you want. Right. You know, uh, uh, it's, it's not just essential. It's, 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 it's like it's everything necessary um, uh, to elevate your stay. So you may find that uh, when you're in our lobby, you may get a lot of things for free that you never got before. Right. You may get free beer. You may get free coffee. You right. may get free water. Uh, you may get little things to snack on. Uh, uh, and, and gestures like that that mean something to people, you know, rather than having... Um, you know, useless gestures and brass buttons and gold epaulets that have been around because the hotel industry needs to change because people change. Right. And, uh, and that's what well, makes people come back. I think and so. And that's what will make them come I back. I think so. Right. You know, uh, addition is a different idea. It, it, it's kind of a, uh, let's call it a kind of cooler, more sophisticated version uh, of a luxury hotel. Okay. You know, you might even call it a Ritz Carlton Light. Uh, you know, it's people who want uh, those kind of more traditional services, uh, but, you know, want it in a kind of very cool, sophisticated environment. Because I wouldn't want to do anything, by the way, that would be competitive, you know, with addition. You know, they, they, they need right. to kind of complement each other. in some, some sort of way. So how did that partnership come about? Were you approached? Did you approach Bill? Or, or how did... I, I uh, actually uh, approached them because I... You know, I think the contributions I've made to the industry uh, wasn't commensurate with the amount of hotels I did. And I did about 40 hotels, but but I, I just felt it would be fun to climb a mountain I never climbed before and do something on a really big scale. Right. And I think Marriott is by far and away the best operator in the industry, and I admired them very much. And, and I went with them, and I wanted to do a deal because I wanted to do something you know, a hotel that we could get out there very fast and do a lot of them and not merely, you know, do a hotel, spend two years on it, have everybody come in, pick the ideas off it and go, you know, appropriate it for their own hotels. So, you know, it's something that I wanted to do because I'd never done it before. Right. And now what are the expectations for addition? Is it is it 100 hotels? I've read a couple of things, but what are their expectations? I'd like to do more than 100 hotels, You'd like quite frankly. More. You know, we're working <laughs> about 25 of them right now. Okay. I mean, and... Um, I've learned a lot. It's been very expansive for me. I mean, a big public company like that has a different approach than an individual entrepreneur. Right. I think uh, an individual entrepreneur can afford mistakes. If you make a mistake, you, you pick yourself up and dust yourself off and move on. A big public company like that doesn't want to make any mistakes. So things are done a little bit by consensus. Right. Uh, you know, we don't do anything by consensus in my own private label. So it's been expansive to me, and it, it was a real learning curve. But it also made me a better hotelier because I understood the other side, and, and it allowed me to increase the amount of work I was doing and not kind of get paralyzed or fixated on a single detail. And, and so I think, it's, I think it's made me better. Right. Great. All right. I just want to shift our focus here. We have a couple of minutes left um, on kind of the panel and your thoughts on, on the discussion today. But one thing I really I want to commend you for your strong discipline in that it's a finance 101 type of a principle is that you, you cannot time the market. And you seem like a guy that you don't try and time the market. You, you put out kind of what you have to offer, and, and that's it. If and when it happens, it happens. Right, exactly. If and there's I, a need for a hotel, period. Right. Not about what... Right. You know, Once I, you go forward, that, exactly. that's, that's your... I did my first hotel when interest rates were 22% under right. Ronald Reagan. I, I had nothing to do with it. There was a need for a hotel. Right. Um, so, so that was one of the first things you actually said to kind of open up the panel, and, and I truly appreciated that because, you know, being an MBA one, I took my first finance class last semester, and Bill Silber, one of the uh, capstone professors here at, at, at Stern, teaches that, and he says, you know, do, you cannot time the market. No. It's something you just have to go forward with. Uh, so I want to just, one last thing was touch on the Airbnb kind of um, situation here in New York. I guess we could focus on New York because that's what the panel was about today. Do you have any other remaining thoughts on kind of Airbnb and, and what types of constraints that has for um, kind of people blinded to, to the whole theme of Airbnb in the industry and what it can really do to maybe damage the brand of hotels and, and kind of capacity of hotels? I cannot believe that the industry is not reacting more to what, what, what's going on with that. And I think until they get hit over the head, 
uh, uh, when they can't pay their payroll or something, uh, they'll finally react. I've, I've heard all the rationales. I've heard, you know, only millennial people do it, and I think I've mentioned and you know, thirty percent of the business is really, um, you know, renting rooms in in, uh, in in somebody's home, and that's not really a big market. But it's just not the case, right. uh, you know. And and and, and there seems to be, you know, an issue about you know how threatening it is, or 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 it isn't. I think there's no question it's threatening. It's a disruption to the industry. It's a, it's a change agent. It's going to change everything. And I think that uh, the, 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 the faster that the hotel industry wakes up to it and, and, and tries to respond to it, uh, you know, whether it's going into that business, which I think they should, uh, or, or, or whatever else they can do, uh, or at least try and delay them like they didn't do in San Francisco. And uh, but I, I think I, I cannot believe it. I feel, I feel like I want to be like Paul Revere and say, <laughs> you know, Airbnb is coming. You know, you March guys, down Fifth Avenue, yeah, right? Uh, it, it, it's like I, I can't believe it. It's right. like a justification. You know, I, I, I think it's, uh, and, 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 and maybe the problem lies in, 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 in a lot of people uh, justifying retention of jobs and maybe a lot of these explanations coming from financial guys that don't really operate hotels and don't right. really see the impact. You know, uh, uh, it's, it's the same kind of thing where, uh, you know, I hear that, that a lot of the supply that's coming on the market, more supply, you know, that's ever come on at one time ever in the city, and people start talking about the strength of New York City, which I believe, and people talk about the demand for hotels in New York City, which I understand, but there's a lot of supply coming. Right. And if you're in the business, it's going to hurt the occupancy rate, period. Right. By definition. So I, I, I just wish the industry would kind of you know, wake up and smell a coffee with this. Right. Do you feel there's any way to kind of quantify the effect that it's having kind of in the short run, or is it too too close too close of a period to tell? You know, well, going? this is the first time, um, I, don't, I don't know, maybe ever, that uh, New York City didn't sell out for um, New Year's Eve. Okay. Uh, and, and I think through the first quarter of, uh, of uh, uh, New York City's uh, ADRs were down. But what's the explanation for that? Right. It can only be supply and or Airbnb. Right, especially I mean, when you're at constant growth across the board and, as far as the economy and, goes. And, and when you hear this, and, and, and the, those are the facts, well, what's the explanation for that? Right. Are we going to deny? It has to be one of those two. Right. can't be anything else. I think probably Airbnb is, is more responsible for it, although uh, the increased supply has an impact. Now, I'm not saying that when you're in the mid-80s, you can't afford more supply. Of course, I'm doing hotels in New York, right. but I wish there wasn't as much supply. Right, of course. Well, Ian, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to, uh, thank to thank you the for interview. Having me. It was really, uh, really a pleasure having you today, and thanks again. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.